next week. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Tyler. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Corso. Um, as Phaedra said, my name is Tyler Reinagle. I am the Associate Vice President for Economic Development. Uh, this is a newly reincarnated office at Kennesaw State, and our primary purpose is to make sure that we're getting our university resources reinvested in the communities that have been responsible for building KSU into the school that it is today. Um, that can come in the form of student experiential learning and internships, volunteer opportunities, work with our local chambers of commerce to get faculty research and innovation reinvested, really whatever it takes to really draw that connection between the university and the communities that we're here to serve. Um, so we're very excited about the development of our strategic plan, uh, working with external partners in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to really drive our office and make sure that we're meeting the community's needs uh, as best we can. Uh, and then also working with our chamber leadership to identify the best opportunities for us to partner in really helping build up the small uh, family-owned and small business startups that we have throughout Cobb County and the metro Atlanta and northwest Georgia regions. Uh, a number of projects that we're working on are an incubator in conjunction with our partners at the Cobb Chamber of Commerce, uh, working to get our Burris Institute for Public Service and Research more visible and more prominent in the community, and then also a lot of community impact work. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kim Henghold, our Director of Community Engagement, to talk about a few events coming up on her side. Kim? Thanks. Thank you, Tyler, and thank you, Dr. Corso. I'm excited to be here today and say hello to everyone, but also to um, tell you about a couple of events that we have coming up that are that are super exciting for the community. So on April 9th, we have our KSU Day of Service. Um, for those of you who have been here for a while, it's been going on since 2014, and every year we increase our volunteers and we also increase the number of nonprofits that we work with. It's designed as an opportunity to say thanks to our local community since they've supported our university throughout the years. And it also um, gives our volunteers the opportunity to meet specific needs for community organizations that we have. So um, it is the one chance of, of the year that the volunteers come from staff, faculty, students, as well as community members and alumni, and we all volunteer alongside each other. So it's a great opportunity to get involved. This year, we have over 20 sites to select from, and the registration is open now on our website. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was our Community Impact Day. Also, a super exciting event for us is it's the first time we've ever had a Community Impact Day here at KSU. Um, and it's going to be a showcase to show outreach and engagement efforts across all of the colleges and units. Um, we're excited to show showcase all of the things that our faculty, staff, um, and our the campus resources and services and how they impact our community. This event is going to be held on April 11th from 9 to noon. Um, at the KSU Center, and we are accepting proposals now um, through March 10th for any student and faculty research projects, service learning courses, campus departments and resources that have a community focus. Um, and this event will also bring university-wide attention to the community pillar for the R2 Roadmap to Success. So um, with that, I appreciate your time and thank you for letting us join you, Dr. Corso. So you can see while the um, Office of Economic Development is brand new, in, in the Office of Research, uh, Kim has been doing community engagement for years and years, and uh, we are just thrilled to have both of them in our office now and doing the great work that they're doing. So thank you. Um, I, we could stop for a second and see if anyone has any questions for either Tyler or Kim. No worries, uh, you can always reach out to them. <laughs> I'm sure they have lots of questions, um, but you can reach out to them directly and we'll just go ahead straight into our program. So I'm I'm very excited to introduce you to Sunanda. Um, before we go into her, yes, yes, we're gonna go into her full bio first. Um, make sure everyone's mic is muted before we do that. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Sunanda. Uh, so first of all, let me just tell you, she hasn't been at KSU very long, although she's been at KSU for a long time. What do I mean by that? Sunanda was at Kennesaw State, no, Kansas State University for years and years and years before, before Ian recruited her here to Kennesaw State. And so I don't know what it is about that KSU thing that she's got going on, but we are uh, very thrilled for Sunanda to, to be here with us. So over the past 20 years, she has conducted research on traffic engineering, uh, and that's not a very important topic for anybody who lives here in Atlanta. 
Um, she also looks at highway design and applications of big data and transportation. So I think we're going to have so many questions for her when we after we hear her video. She has traveled domestically and internationally continue to continue her efforts on understanding and assisting with the best practices to increase transportation and highway safety. She joined Kennesaw State University in the fall of 2021 after serving as the Associate Dean of the Graduate School at, at Kansas State, as I mentioned before. She holds a PhD in Civil Transportation Engineering from the University of South Florida. And with that, we're going to do our darndest to show you a video, so hold on. One moment. My name is Sonanda Disanayaka, and I am the chair of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Southern Polytechnic College of Engineering and Engineering Technology and Professor of Civil Engineering. Growing up in Sri Lanka, a developing country with limited resources, I had no idea there was a group labeled first generation college students, even though I belong in that group. However, I had two key factors working in my favor. First, my parents, who were teachers, made it very clear that I was expected to work very hard on the competitive university entrance exam and go to college, which was not optional by any means. Second, the country I was born and raised, higher education opportunities were available for free. However, this caused the admission process to be extremely competitive with a limited number of openings available for new students, making me work very hard. I would have never become the female engineering professor and the administrator at a major university in the United States without these opportunities. As a child, I did not have a clear idea of what I wanted to pursue as a career. However, I knew that I was not adept at memorizing information, but enjoyed solving practical problems of relevance. That led to a career in engineering instead of medicine which were the only two areas of employment in Sri Lanka that guaranteed sustainable living, at least at the time. I am so glad that I pursued this career as I thoroughly enjoy engineering and appreciate the versatility it has given me. During my academic career, I found that I was specifically drawn to transportation engineering. I am a visual learner and you can see transportation everywhere. You can see traffic delays, imperfect high infrastructure designs, crashes happening, or issues with traffic patterns and driver behavior, to name a few. Since we all use transportation systems on a day-to-day -day basis, it is really where our research with relevance takes place. Even if you don't drive, you are still a pedestrian, or you take public transportation. The need for safe and efficient transportation systems and process improvement is imperative to everyone around the world. It is also one of the key factors for the economic development of any geographical region. In 2010, I was named a Fulbright Scholar, allowing me to take a sabbatical from the United States and return to Sri Lanka to conduct research on how to resolve traffic conditions in a developing country, which has a different set of highway issues than countries like the United States. In cities like Atlanta, the amount of traffic and the severity of crashes due to the speeds at which people drive here also make it a great area to study traffic patterns and highway safety. For example, during the five-year time period from 2016 to 2020, Georgia experienced nearly 1.5 million motor vehicle crashes, which resulted in about 711,000 injuries and 7,798 fatalities. A key factor of all my research, no matter where I am, is finding a balance between traffic operations and highway safety. These can conflict with each other, and the goal is to find a balance. My research is based on practical applications about improving the systems that we use in the real world. Due to this, my research lab is in the field looking at roadway networks, and I utilize computing facilities to analyze and model field data collected related to the traffic, motor vehicle crashes, and highway operations. The information collected varies based on location 
as does the driver behaviors. I have previously been involved in finding practical solutions about improving the safety and traffic operations of several types of infrastructure related to our transportation systems. In the past, I have worked on funded research related to speed limit related topics, large truck safety, geometric design of roads, red light running, lane temperature crashes, and various special population groups such as young drivers, older drivers, pedestrians, and motorcyclists to name a few. We look at traffic and roadway characteristics, the types of vehicles on the road, varied traffic patterns, and drive characteristics come up with solutions to improve safety and efficiency of road users. I moved to Kansas State University at the beginning of fall 2021 after spending 19 years at another KSU, Kansas State University, as a faculty member and then as an administrator. Soon after becoming a faculty member in the U.S., I came to the realization that today's first-generation college students, minorities and underrepresented groups, or even females, don't have the same opportunities to become successful engineers. I came to Kennesaw State to serve both chair and professor, allowing me to interact with the students and provide them with research experiences related to my fields of interest. Especially being near a big city such as Atlanta will open new research opportunities for me. My work with students at KSU is no different. I am currently working with Mia Kohn, a first-year civil engineering major participating in the first-year scholars program sponsored by the Office of Undergraduate Research. This research focuses on finding ways to improve seat belt usage among young drivers by studying the patterns of college students at KSU and analyzing survey results completed by the students. The mission of a major research university is not only instruction, but also the generation of new knowledge through research and transfer and application of this knowledge through education and service activities. It is important we conduct research that is intellectually stimulating and rewarding. And that is my goal here at KSU. Great, thank you so much. Thank you to Megan Lowney, who is the new STRATCOM uh, director in the Office of Research. And thank you, Sananda, for your time and effort in, in developing that um, that really wonderful video that highlights the important work you're doing, the, the research you're doing that is extremely relevant to all of us, um, particularly here in Atlanta where we face um, a, a number of traffic issues that you have identified. So I'm going to start off the questions, but because we're in teams, this makes it really easy for you all to participate. So if you want to ask a question, you can raise your virtual hand, you can raise your actual hand, and if I see it, I'll call on you or you can just interrupt. So you have a whole bunch of different ways to um, to get engaged in this conversation, but I'll go ahead and start. Uh, and I'm going to start with um, with the Fulbright scholarship that you had where you went to Sri Lanka, which is which is a developing country, not a developed country like ours. And so I think it would be helpful for us to understand traffic and traffic issues beginning with a developing country and what might be faced there relative to what's faced here. Yes, um, first of all, thank you for that great video and all the hard work and thank you everybody for being here. Um, you are perfectly correct. Um, there are major difference between uh, developing countries and here in the United States. Uh, we have a lot of different traffic issues and things uh, in both countries. So I think one of the key differences between um, developing countries and here is for start uh, as a starting point in, in Sri Lanka, you drive on the left hand side of the road. As you know, here we drive on the right hand side. So when you look at um, the whole world, um, there are about 125, 165 countries who drive on the right hand side of the road, assuming that you have two directions of travel and rest of the world, about um, 65, 75 countries, they drive on the left-hand side. So this has a major impact on the traffic patterns and how we behave. As an example, if you look at the traffic signal, if it is red and if you are waiting to make the right turn, you can stop there and see whether there is a gap and you can make that moment, right turn moment. But on the other hand, if you are driving in a left-hand side driving country, you cannot do that. So in that 
situation, you can make the left turn after waiting for a gap. So that makes a major difference. And in a roundabout here, we drive in the counterclockwise direction, right? So if you look at a roundabout in a left hand side driving country, it goes in the clockwise direction. So there are major differences in traffic patterns depending on which side of the road you drive. And of so, course, yes. yes. I'm sorry, Sunanda. So what does that mean in terms of um, excess crashes or fatalities? Does it mean that if you're a left, left hand driving country that, that you'll experience more crashes? Uh, not necessarily. If you are if you are driving only in that country, you get used to that. But if you try to drive in another country where you have the opposite side of driving, then it becomes a challenging situation because you are not used to that. And the other difference that comes with that side of driving that you drive is the where the steering wheel is in your vehicle. So here in the right hand side of driving. Our steering wheel, your driving seat in the left side of the vehicle, but in the other part, it is on the other side, right hand side. So you have to adjust if you are switching countries, but if you are stick to one country, that is not going to affect that much. So but that I guess a, a difference from a, between. But from a, I'm sorry, but from a scientific standpoint, which as a scientist of this uh, of this of this phenomenon, which is your recommendation. What is the the least the least probability of having crashes or fatalities with driving patterns? Or I is it the same? Really, I do not really think there's a major difference between two. Once you get used to one system, mm -hmm. it is if you start switching. For example, if I go on vacation to Sri Lanka, you know, when I'm driving, I have to be really careful because mm -hmm. everything's in the opposite side. But as long as you're driving in one country. I don't think there's one system which is superior than the other. They are pretty much the same. So in developing countries, is it the case that that the that the economy is growing faster than the infrastructure to the, the traffic infrastructure to support the economy? Because you see these pictures of cars and bicycles and all of these like different types of transportation all in the same setting without doesn't seem like there's a lot of rules or regulations and so what is your thought about as these developing countries quickly become you know economic powerhouses but they don't have the infrastructure that comes up behind them have you seen that in sri lanka that is totally true i think that is the other major difference between the two countries so here we have mostly passenger vehicles traffic right but in the developing countries, it's a complex mix of vehicles. You have cars, trucks, buses, lorries, um, and three wheelers, motorcycles, bicycles, mixed up with pedestrians. And then you sometimes even see block carts in the mix of traffic. So the traffic composition is very complicated. So that is one thing. And then you are totally right. So the incomes in the developing world, they are increasing. So the cars are becoming more affordable. So people are buying more and more vehicles, cars, but the infrastructure is not going at the same rate. So they are kind of slow too, because you need a lot of funding and which is lacking in the developing world. So there's, there's a delay in reaching that uh, infrastructure level that is needed. Mm -hmm. So I'm just uh, noting a comment here from Dean Swan who does um, who does some uh, lots of research in U Uganda, and so mm -hmm. she's just commenting that she has to switch back and forth in terms of her driving behavior. So, uh, so she's giving you a good example there of what you just described. So let, let's talk about the research that you're doing here in the U.S. So you um, you were in Kansas for many many years and did research uh, with students, and and I. Uh, have been to Kansas. I haven't lived there, but I just can only imagine that the traffic patterns in Kansas are different than here in Georgia. And so what were you studying specifically there and what are some of the the um, challenges that they face there that we might not experience here in Georgia? Yes, it's, it's a different scale. Um, is When you compare countries, the, the differences are drastic. But if you look at different geographical regions and states, there are still differences. So in Kansas, I think it is mostly rural. And whereas here in Georgia and Atlanta area, what we have is urban um, 
population and then a lot of traffic. So in Kansas, mostly it is about rural transportation. That does not mean it is safe. It's a different set of um, issues and concerns that you have in that kind of environment. For example, in rural areas, you see a lot of lane departure crashes. So you expect drivers to stay in the lane, but in rural areas, you have long stretches of two lane roadways. So the enforced level, level is very low because you have vast lands and it is simply not possible to have higher levels of enforcement. And when you have open space, stretches of roads, it's pretty easy to speed. So the driving speeds are pretty high and then you lack focus and uh, you lose attention. And the moment that happens, the vehicles are running off the road and hitting trees and various um, objects on the roadside. So one of the major sources of fatalities is this running off the road type crashes. But here in an urban area, that may not be that critical because you don't really have um, that kind of high speeding possibility in a highly congested type of a road. So the traffic mm -hmm. issues and safety problems are different. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, Ian, I see you have your hand up. Um, I believe I've solved the problem of driving on different sides of the road. Um, when I did advice drive, advanced driving once, what they said was, was to drive in the middle of the road and the best thing to do is to have your steering wheel over the line in the middle and that's the safest place to be. Um, unless you're coming in the other direction, so that works. But I think you started touching on something I was gonna really ask about. Uh, when I've traveled around, I've seen these really quite radical differences when I um, fly into a different state. Sometimes in the way, even in, in, even in cities, it's almost like you're in a different country, how people um, drive. So one example I've seen in Georgia, and some of this I don't know if it's even legislative, in terms of how people are taught to drive. But in Georgia, people never go into the intersection and wait for the lights to change. So what you find is you you don't see people, um, and I spoke to somebody else about this, and he said, yeah, you know, you have 120 cars in each direction that don't get through those two cars because they sit at the line and when the lights change, they don't turn. So how much of this has to do with just people and how they behave, a human factors issue, relative to light and sequences and that. And so if I just give one other example, I'm sorry to ramble on, you know, in, in Georgia, you sit at the um, traffic lights for two and a half hours, well, sorry, two and a half minutes <laughs> waiting for them to change. And by that time, I've written half a novel or something else, you know, and you're distracted because of the length of time. So a little bit of a compound question, but those, those differences are really quite apparent, um, even in congested and even in city areas, yeah? That is, that is true. So when you have a lot of traffic, your signal length, the total cycle length has to be longer. Otherwise, every time you switch, you also lose certain time. So because of that cycle length has to be longer, and then when drivers typically lose patience. I have been waiting here this long, and, and sometimes there's not even traffic on the other side. You still have to wait. So that adds to the frustration. And a lot of that, like you mentioned, is human factor related things. So when I move from Kansas to here, I see um, the level of aggressiveness of drivers, impatience level is pretty high here. You know, the other day I was driving to Walmart. Um, it was dark um, in the rain. So I was driving at the speed limit, 45, uh, because it was not really safe. I know the coefficient of friction goes down when it is wet, so I had to be safe. And then drivers behind me were all getting impatient. So they are trying to save a split second by overtaking in this heavy rain in the dark. So uh, I think that kind of aggressiveness, it, it varies depending on the area. So I, I feel that that level is a little bit higher here compared to some other states. Thank you for right, that. Thank and you. Thank you for that, Ian. And you were, um, I don't think that was a Freudian slip. Sometimes it feels like two and a half hours when you're waiting. For <laughs> it does, it does. And then suddenly it takes off and everybody's tooting, right? But each place really is quite radically different, yeah? 
Listen, I just drove through Atlanta last night, and I don't know how many of you have ever driven. I'm sure many, all of you have driven from Atlanta to the coast, and you have to get through that Lovejoy area. And I don't care what kind of traffic uh, the the Peach Pass lanes they put in there. You just can't get through at certain times or all times of the day, and I do not understand it. I don't understand it. I'll just add one other comment then. So my, I remember us at Georgia Tech when they expanded the the connector downtown between 75 and 85. And I looked at it and I said, well, I think all they're going to do is make a larger tra um, parking lot for cars, which seems to have been the case. Um, so my question to Sananda is, um, if there was one thing that you would suggest in terms of how people would be doing traffic management in and around Atlanta that isn't apparent, um, what would that be other than um, getting people off the road? Well, getting people off the road completely is not possible. I think, uh, you know, this um, because of the exposure in Europe, um, I think we have to promote and uh, do more with public transportation. I think that would be, um, we are addicted to the vehicle and we always drive because it's more convenient. Uh, but uh, if public transportation is there, if that could be improved, um, I think more and more people, at least a little bit more people, would be more willing to use public transportation. So you see that in Europe and many other countries, but in the US, um, so we, we really are using our vehicle all the time. Single person in one vehicle is not really ideal when you have a whole lot of traffic. Yeah. Good answer. Uh, we have Thank a couple you. of questions. Uh, Cam Cameron, you've had your hand up. Hey, Samantha. <clears throat> How are you? So I'll say I, I do feel your pain in traveling back home and driving on the left and coming back here, driving on the right. Many of us uh, faculty members and staff who come from these types of countries go through it and it's it's always an interesting challenge. But anyway, my, my question is, um, you mentioned uh, um, a lot about driver behavior, you know, in your in the research, and it, it seemed to me that um, that sounds like a good synergy between civil engineering faculty and psychology faculty. And I was wondering if that occurs or has occurred in the past. Have you ever worked with psychologists or do they do they not communicate with each other? Um, I know with the coming of autonomous vehicles, then that would probably eliminate that need, but we still have a while. Um, yes, that that um, area of research exists. Um, traffic engineers work with psychologists. I have not really done a whole lot in that area. Um, in in when you try to improve traffic operations and safety type things, there are three approaches you can take. You have engineering approaches, we call three E's, and you have enforcement related things and you have education. So three E's and recently people are adding um, emergency response as another E because it is also important, the quick response time. Uh, but three E's are the key. So I have mainly been focusing on the engineering side of things, but there are some researchers who do that kind of overlapping uh, human behavior. And I have worked with some industrial engineering faculty in my previous institution, so they have provided that insight. But there are some other people who are more involved in that kind of collaborative type research. Okay. Are there grants that um, would, would that be beneficial from a research grant standpoint? I guess Pedro would, would could, could have there, there are grant opportunities, I think. Uh, there was um, Office of um, Behavioral Research um, and that kind of, I think uh, even CDC might have funding. Uh, so there are a couple of other institutions providing grant funding for that kind of research. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank yeah, Cameron, I think you're, you saw my comment or maybe you saw my comment. I think your question is right on. And, it, and if you think about, um, you know, really important nonprofits that give money to solve big problems in the world, like 
the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates, they're looking for interdisciplinary approaches to solving problems. And so I think your question is right on. I think Sunanda's research adds one piece to it, but you know, finding those other collaborators uh, either on campus or not uh, to go after some of these other uh, foundation funding is, is an excellent idea. Okay. Yes. Uh, I see Bill has his hand up. You're next. Thank you, Phaedra. Uh, so hello, Sunanda. Glad to have you here at Kansas State. And, um, you know, thank you for your research on this very important topic, especially given that traffic accidents are a leading cause of death for teenagers and young adults all around the world. Um, by the way, I'm originally from Singapore, which is a left driving country. <laughs> and when I go back there and I cross the streets, I need to be really deliberate about looking in the correct direction so that, you know, I don't get hit by cars. <laughs> yep. uh, so that is only something, uh, something that we share in common. Uh, so anyway, um, autonomous vehicles have been in the news recently because of several fatal crashes of Tesla cars when they are in self-driving mode. So since these cars use various sensors in addition to cameras, I'm wondering if you could tell us if and how civil engineers are using um, different ways and researching ways to take advantage of these sensors because many of them work outside the visible spectrum. Um, so uh, are they researching ways to improve traffic safety, perhaps in collaboration with engineers from other disciplines? Yes, I think that is a kind of an emerging area of research. A um, lot of things, research opportunities are there. Um, my research part has um, ask if you are not speaking to mute your mic so that's we can hear Sunanda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So my um, research in the past has been a little bit um, different from that direction, um, but there are a lot of opportunities and um, there are, for example, um, sensors to detect the potential to have a crash, not just electric vehicles like Tesla, but even um, regular vehicles. So there are sensors that can, can if they are coming closer and there are a lot of other variables that they are considering and there's a higher potential to have a crash. So before really the crash happens, the sensors can predict various parameters and based on that give a signal or provide some kind of a warning to the driver that it is going to happen. It has a high likelihood of a crash happening because of this combination of factors so that the driver will be able to make some interference and make a stop, avoid the crash. So a lot of opportunities in that area um, in the future in for imaging areas with automatic um, vehicles, automatic vehicle systems. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so Sunanda, I wanna ask about Atlanta traffic. So last week, I'm just going to share my own personal story. Last weekend, I went downtown uh, to a concert um, at the State Farm Arena, and right in front of my car, I had two of two young people. We'll, we'll say they're Georgia Tech students. I don't know that for sure, but <laughs> they were young people on those little scooters right in front of me, and they were not on the side. They were absolutely in the middle of the lane for the cars, and I mean, seriously, I didn't know what to do. Like, do we let them go in front of us at 10 miles an hour? Do we try to scoot around them? And I feel like this is this is n new to us here in the US, but not new to other countries, because I think these, particularly in developing countries, they have multi-mode transportation that has been going on for a long time. But I guess I, I wanna hear from you as the expert in the field, what can we do in Atlanta to make our roads safe, not just for the cars, but for the other kinds of transportation? Because I know there are fatalities that are occurring with these scooters or other types of, of elect, um, you know, in, individual electric vehicles. And I, I wanna know what you would suggest on how to make that improvement. 
Um, so I can I mentioned the three E's earlier. So I think in order to improve um, this motorized scooter safety also, you have to take actions in all different areas. One is not going to be enough. So for the engineering side, I think there need to be proper ways um, for the, to accommodate this. So in um, Georgia Tech downtown area, I think that the lanes, lane width, the standard lane width for traffic operations is 12 feet. But there are some lanes um, which are like 10 feet wide. So even for a car, it is really um, not easy to navigate that kind of travel lanes. You need a little bit more space. So when you try to share that space with a scooter or a bicycle or something, that is not going to be a safe environment. So I think geometric design improvements are really needed to accommodate these different types of road users, which we call as vulnerable road users. Because if these uh, scooters or bicycles or even pedestrians hit a vehicle, the damage is going to the, that vulnerable road user, right? It is not going to be to the vehicle. So I think we have to protect, if you want to encourage this kind of transportation, there need to be proper paths. So I don't know the exact location, but maybe there it lacks a proper path, additional space for those scooters to you know, utilize. And then another key important thing is the motorcycle um, case that we saw that you can reduce the fatalities by about 50% if they are wearing a motorcycle helmet, if you happen to be in a crash. So the same thing is going to be valid for these scooters. So if the motorcycle helmet usage could be improved, or it can be um, enforced. I don't know whether that is possible, but at least encouragement uh, to use these helmets would really help in saving lives. Because if you are not wearing a helmet, and if you happen to hurt your head, that's going to be a severe injury case. So that, and then education, the other E, you know, you have to educate both um, scooter users and also motor vehicle users. How to, how to share the roadways, how to share the space that is available. So I think, again, all three E's are going to be important in improving safety. But on the other hand, I feel like we need to be encouraging that kind of transportation. It is health benefits are there. You are reducing the number of vehicles on the roadways. So there's a positive side. So we had to um, uh, come up with ideas to improve the sharing of the road space. Yeah, I think, thank you for your, your answer. I, I think you are highlighting the, that just the, the, what you might want to do to fix the problem may not be possible for, for infrastructure reasons or cost reasons, but you still want to promote it because it's healthy and all those things, but there's, there's kind of a pull. It's systematic versus, you know, the operational part that you talked about. I think we have another hand up. Monica, Nandan, come on down. Good afternoon, Sunanda. It's such yeah. a pleasure to hear and learn about your research. I think coming from India um, and also from Kansas, I'm also originally from Missouri, so I can relate to both examples. And in India, to, to give an example, how cows, buffaloes, goats, bikes, three wheelers, four wheelers, five wheelers, nine wheelers, everybody co coexists really on those narrow streets. And I will say the number of accidents in India are way less comparatively given the you know the crowd i'm just guessing the number of traffic accidents but my question was more pertaining to the you mentioned a good point about things like bird and two wheelers the example that fedra gave about what happens downtown and um as, as we think about this and more and more younger generations my daughter is actually interviewing with bird as we speak and so it's interesting that you mentioned that there's a new industry she's learning about and uh this generation is expanding using alternate modes of transportation. Um, is, so the, 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 if our mindset, the engineering mindset, the policy mindset was more traditional, has been more traditional, and you're coming up with these new innovative modalities of transportation, besides engineering, what are these companies doing in terms of policy for advocating for broader roads, alternate lanes? So when they manufacture these alternate 
transportation mechanisms. Aren't they also doing policy work? I'm just asking, I don't know. Well, they are supposed to. Uh, so, uh, for example, the helmet usage, you know, if it comes as a guideline. So, um, if you look at the motorcycle helmet usage, that policy varies across the United States. In some cases, it's mandatory. Sometimes it's not mandatory. Sometimes in between. So, there are various different types of policies across the country about motorcycles. Um, but for this kind of uh, new scooters and birds, but not, there are so many different systems. Um, there aren't that much um, guidance policy. So I think it is important for the companies to work and everybody to promote and work on those kind of uh, policies, developing good guidelines uh, to make sure that the space available, roadway space is shared safely and efficiently, I think, you know. I think there needs to be more work in the policy field. work. Besides the engineering and innovation work, simultaneously policy work for exactly. whatever is at stake. Exactly. Yes. So, Sunana, you talked about in the video that your team of students and researchers collect data in the field. Can you give us an example of what that would look like if I were a student working on your team? Um, so, like I said, um, um, it's not um, a lab based work for data collection in my case. It's traffic engineering, so the lab is outside in the field. Um, so, I will take one example. Um, one of the projects I had is about red light running cameras, uh, red light running. So, you know, um, we all tend to, um, so sometimes we ask the question when you have the orange sign in the signal, what does that mean? So we jokingly say that means you had to speed up and somehow pass the intersection, which is not. So um, red light running is a pretty um, serious issue because you think you can beat that yellow and pass, but that length is not enough. So you run the red light. That means your chance of having a head on type of collision with the vehicle coming in the other direction is pretty high. So there were particularly a um, couple of intersections where red light running was pretty high. So the state wanted to see whether there is something they can do. Again, engineering type of an improvement to reduce red light running. So we studied different options and also cost is a major concern in making any kind of an improvement. So we wanted to keep the cost as low as, as possible. So one of the things we tested was um, retro reflective type border for the signal plate. So if there's more visibility when the signal is changing colors, you know, would that reduce red light running? So we want to investigate and do research on that. So this is a field experiment. So what we did was we considered number of locations where there's high percentage of red light running incidents and then selected the signal, the plates, and then we put the retro reflective uh, lines edge along those signal lights. So before that, we collected data. After that, collect data. So it is a before and after study. So in the field, in that case, we collected data, red light running and the conflict data using cameras. So video cameras kind of captured what is happening actually in the field. And then you bring back those data to the lab. Graduate students spend time manually, or there are some um, software packages available now as well. So you reduce the data and obtain the information. So you do that for before and after, compare, and you make the decision whether your retroreflective plating is effective or not. So that is just one example of how you collect the data. So the graduate students stay in the field without um, being noticed by the drivers, because otherwise that's going to change the driver behavior. So record and then come back to the lab, reduce data, and then analyze. OK, good. Thank you for that. And what did what what was the result of that research? In that case, it was effective. It was effective. Yes, that reduced red light running by a significant uh, percentage. Yes, mm -hmm. so it was something to do with the visibility. Mm -hmm. So here at KSU, you you've just started a PhD program in engineering, so you'll have graduate, you'll have doctoral students to work with very soon if you're not already 
but you did mention in the video that you're working with a first year scholar, which warms my heart and I'm sure Amy Buddy's heart too, <laughs> who's on this call. And so um, describe to us or explain to us what's what are you looking for with a freshman that's joining your research team and how that differs from the skill set that obviously you would have from a, a, a senior level graduate student or a doctoral student? Yes, that's a really good question. Yes, I think that the key difference is the level of depth we go into in each case. So if I'm working with a freshman, I think you have to get into the freshman level and it should be some real world situation which kind of makes sense, easy to understand. And also we have to give them very clear instructions on what we are doing and why we are doing and then kind of direct more. And for example, if um, my um, freshman um, scholar is working on seed belt related project, she's conducting a survey um, to understand the seed belt usage patterns of college students, KSU students. Um, so I think when you do that, if it is when it comes to the analysis part, you have to give clear instructions. This is what you have to do because they have not done any courses or learn anything about statistical modeling or in-depth type of analysis. So it is important to have uh, give them, provide them with clear instructions on how to analyze the data. So that level is going to be completely different if you are working with the PhD student, because at that level, they are expected to do a very in-depth type of a research and find something new and contribute to the existing body of knowledge. So that is advanced things. And they also have to do certain things on their own without um, exact guidance. You're not going to tell your PhD student exactly how he or she has to do the research. So they also have to come up with ideas, contribute, and that is how the dissertation is built up. But your freshman, on the other hand, needs a lot of support and guidance and working at that level. So these two depths are completely different, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So in, in comparison to your own training in Sri Lanka, did you were you afforded uh, research opportunities very early on in your studies? And is that was and how did that impact you if that is if that is true? No, that is not true. Uh, developing countries at the time, they did not have resources and research was not something um, that is why I feel that our students here are very lucky to have this kind of opportunities to work on research right from the beginning. Um, so this semester, well, fall semester, we had seven first year scholars in our department. So it was a great, great opportunity for us to work with these students and identify the future graduate students among them. Um, no, I did not have that opportunity. I would have done more if I had that. <laughs> Which is exactly why we're we're doing that first year yeah. scholars program, because we know that if you get them early, they're going to stay in the field. So you showed a, a wonderful picture in your video of your of your family, which includes your your two beautiful daughters. And I'm just curious as a first generation, um, not just a first generation college student, but also a female engineer. What advice have you given to your daughters as they pursue and are, and are do, do you encourage them to go into the fields of medicine and engineering like you were encouraged or 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 how how are you navigating that with your daughters? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think we we all parents kind of um, have this uh, <laughs> experience. Uh, I think it all depends on the context and the culture and the society that we live in. Um, so when I was growing up in Sri Lanka, um, if I did not get into medicine or engineering, there were no other alternative options and I wouldn't have done well in those options available. So that is why I think my parents were really pushing for that. But here, on the other hand, I think there are many opportunities. So I think as an immigrant, I think I, many of you who are immigrants would agree this is land of opportunities. We just have to... Uh, encourage our students to utilize those opportunities available. So um, I still encourage them to be in a STEM area uh, because I think uh, the need is there. So um, I think that uh, it depends on what, what you're looking for. I think there are two um, goals. 
So you have the personal side of the story. I think that contributed for me to get into, or my parents to encourage me to get into those areas. And then you also have the societal, you know, society has a need for infrastructure systems, roads, bridges, water systems, and all those things. Society has a huge need. So that's why civil engineering is there. So um, there are many other areas where uh, my kids or any other kid um, can contribute. So those are more in STEM areas. That is why I encourage. But here it is a little bit different from what I experienced as a child, I think. So in case my kids listen to this one later, <laughs> they, they are in STEM areas. Um, one is a data scientist at um, the Gates Foundation in Seattle, and the other one is doing computer science in a, another university. So they are in STEM. So um, one thing I do is to really push them to go and reach the highest possible potential and set the bar high. So I think I have the same thing for the students here, uh, and I treat them like our own kids. And if we want our kids to be successful, we want our students to be successful too. So set the bar high and try harder, uh, because if you set the bar low, you will simply walk over that. You would not really try to achieve anything. So I'd say the same thing to my kids and also the students. Thank you, Sananda. You are, are such an asset to us here at KSU. We are thrilled for you to be here. You're a role model uh, to, to women. You're a role model to, to, to female engineers. Um, and the research with relevance that you're doing is really amazing. And so we thank you so much um, for being here. Um, if there are no other questions, and I don't see any hands up or anybody interrupting, um, I think we're going to go ahead and close. I do want to share with you that we're going to stick with this this team's um, uh, approach to doing this sh this show, because I do think it lends itself to a little bit more dialogue between those in the uh, those in the viewing audience and the presenter. And so, I uh, as much as I enjoy being in person, I think we're still in this weird transition phase uh, because of the pandemic. So I think we'll stick with Teams. Um, on March fourth we are featuring another chair and director, Dr. Ramazan Eigen. He is the director of research computing uh, in the Office of Research, my office, and he's also an associate professor of computer science in the College of Computing and Software Engineering. And we're changing the time frame. Uh, if, if you recall, we chose 4 p.m. on a Friday at the beginning of the pandemic because we were all stuck at home. And we thought that 4 p.m. on a Friday would be that everyone could um, uh, put an adult beverage by their hand and, and relax while they listen to some great research at KSU. Um, but we've moved out of that era, and, and so we're starting to see our participation drop off because it's 4 p.m. on Friday. And so we're going to change the time to be um, 11 a.m. on Friday. And um, unfortunately, I have an NIH meeting that I have to attend that day, and so we're going to have a different host, and our host will be Dr. Chris Cornelison, who is um, the Director of Intellectual Property Development in my office, and he's also an assistant professor in the College of Science and Mathematics. And uh, Chris is a, is a wonderful person and will be a great host for that day. So um, with that, I just, um, I just wish you all happiness, healthy uh, healthy weekend, happy weekend. A big thank you to Sananda and to, um, to Megan and to Heather and to all the people in my office who work very hard to put these events together. And um, we hope to see you soon and take care. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Many thanks.